I phoned my sister. I'm stuck in the barn and there's a big cat outside. Can you come and do something? And she laughed at me. I just froze. <laughs> didn't want to move because I didn't want it coming towards me or anything, something like that. You think, where the hell has that come from? Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. Welcome to episode 81 of Big Cat Conversations. We are recording this one in mid-August, and that's because we are based at a big cat stand at the Denby and Flint Show in North East Wales. We are here meeting people, including big cat witnesses, who call in. A big thanks go to the Denby and Flint Show for hosting us and allowing us this opportunity. For our first guest, we are joined by local politician Darren Miller. Darren represents Clwyd West in North East Wales in the Welsh Parliament, and we are here in his constituency in Denby. Darren is a long-serving Conservative politician with many responsibilities and many different interests. And amongst those interests are big cats. Darren takes the subject very seriously. He knows of ongoing credible reports in the region. And he has encouraged some of his colleagues in both the Conservative and Labour Party to take an interest in the subject. It's a pleasure to be with Darren for part of the day and see him discussing the subject with visitors to the show. So, Darren, thanks for coming on the podcast and welcome. It's a pleasure, an absolute pleasure, Rick. And uh, I'm just delighted that there's been such significant interest. The stall behind us is absolutely packed at the moment with people uh, picking up some of those evidence pictures and also, more interestingly, making reports about sightings in our locality, which is what I was very keen to gather. Yes, yeah, lovely. We can only research this subject with people, local people's input, and we're getting that, and they're talking together, swapping notes, swapping views and everything. There's no right or wrong. So we've got the whole community working at it together, so that's really nice. People yeah. are very curious, aren't they? And uh, I think what struck me uh, the most is the reaction uh, that you get from people. I mean, most people are just curious. They want to know more about the subject. They're not frightened of the idea of big cats in the countryside. They're interested, and if they're out there, they want to know more about them, they want more research, and, uh, you know, they'd love to see them for themselves. So I think this is going to spike something which is going to go on for some time in terms yeah. of a local interest. Yeah, we'll try and come back and do it year on year. I hope so. so the rain's just uh, come in. If you can hear pitter-patter on the canvas above us, it's just started raining, but we've had a nice day so far. But, Darren, can we start with why you got interested in the subject. How did you first learn about the subject and how did you get into it? Well, you know, I've been a member of the Senev now, uh, the Welsh Parliament, for 15 years. And in my first term as a member of the then National Assembly for Wales, uh, one Christmas there was a really interesting report on the front page of one of our local newspapers about a farmer who had discovered a footprint in the snow around the Clokainog Forest area, which is just down the road, of what appeared to be a big cat print. And that really triggered a bit of curiosity on my part to want to know more about the subject. Uh, So it was at that point that I began to discuss with some of my colleagues in the Senate, look, you know, what do we know about this phenomenon? Has any research been conducted in Wales, particularly in my constituency where this print uh, had been seen? And of course, as I began to ask questions, it was very clear that this wasn't the first piece of evidence about big cats in the countryside in my own constituency. It was just a piece of evidence which was the first time that I'd ever read about something. So that's what really triggered my interest. And of course, since then, there have been many, many reports in the locality from people who claim to have seen unusual sightings of big cats. Do you think, Darren, there is quite a sort of status and image issue for somebody like a politician to admit that they think this is interesting and worth pursuing and taking seriously? Do you think some people are a bit guarded because they're worried that they'll get ridiculed or they'll think, ooh, can we really trust that that member of Senate or that politician because it's a weird subject to take an interest? Is there that kind of problem? I I think some people are a bit cautious about coming forward. I think the great thing is, you know, as soon as I started asking questions about these things in the Senate, it did cause people to reach out to me from all stratas of life 
telling me about the experiences that they'd had. You know, I had the mayoress of a local town tell me that her father had been leaving uh, leaving food out for a big cat for years at, at the bottom of his garden. Uh, he lived in a very uh, rural part of the constituency. Had others uh, contact me, other farmers, uh, to say that they'd had some of their livestock attacked. You know, and these were serious people who had no reason to make these things up. And of course, you know, these sightings go on. They are happening month by month. We're clocking them up in the area. And it's quite clear that there's something out there. You know, you don't get such volumes of uh, reports without there being something out there. I haven't seen one myself yet. I'd love to be able to. And that's one of the reasons why I'm keen to support your work, Rick, in wanting to make sure that there's proper research into the evidence that's out there for these big cats, particularly in northeast Wales uh, and the Cheshire borders. Yeah, well, it's splendid to hear that attitude and approach from a, a local politician. So wonderful that you've got that attitude. Now, I know you've raised it at different times in the Senate. I mean, sometimes you have been scoffed at, haven't you? you do, it's not always easy to, to try and pursue it with other political parties or in a sort of um, knockabout system of politics, is it? It's, it's not always easy, but, you know, I think it's important that we ask questions that members of the public ask us to, to ask. And, you know, I've been asked by people in my constituency, you know, whether there's any credible research being done into this area. There are people who have all sorts of questions that they raise with me. And, uh, you know, it's my duty as an elected representative to represent their views as much as anybody else. So I have no issue with raising questions periodically in the Senate about this important issue. And I want to see more research done. I think it's something which fascinates a lot of people, which has the opportunity to attract people into North East uh, Wales as well. Curious minds are people who are prepared to travel to try and find out the truth about things. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, Big Cats is one of those things that people want to know the truth about. Yeah. You can understand, Darren, that say you were cornered by people to say, we must allocate a budget, we must allocate staff time, we must pursue this. In a way, you don't know how it's going to go, you don't know how much that budget's going to be, you don't know how many staff time it's going to be, and you could get criticised for pursuing a subject which some people feel is not credible or is a bit sort of edgy. But you can understand the political difficulty in starting approaching this subject for real, can you? Yeah, of course, of course. Look, there are always going to be competing priorities for governments to, uh, to spend their money on. We see that every single year. There are all sorts of things that I think the Welsh government could disinvest in <laughs> in order to put a small amount of money aside, uh, you know, tens of thousands, in order to be d able to do some quality research into this, uh, into this area. And I think that's pretty small beer in the scheme of things and that they ought to be able to do that. In terms of the, the work you've seen today, interacting with, with local people and the attitude survey, what have you made of people's feedback and, and the specific attitudes you've seen on the sticky dot voting board and what you've heard from punters? Yeah, well, as I say, I think it's very clear that people are curious. They want to know more. They'd love to see some survey work done. There are obviously some people who think that this could be a tool to attract new tourists uh, into the area as well, which is another important industry in Cluid West. And I just hope that they will continue to maintain this interest going forward and that you know, other politicians will see this as a sign that there's a green light to go ahead with pursuing some more information about, about these things. And look, Rick, you know, your programme, I know, has worldwide reach with people across every continent that tune in, listen in uh, to these podcasts. And I think that, you know, hopefully there may be even some private money to invest in research in North East Wales, given the density of the number of sightings that we've had in recent years. There doesn't seem to be a week or month go by without somebody else reporting a sighting. Uh, so that tells me there's definitely something out there. It's obviously bolder than some of these big cats are in other parts of the UK because it seems to be having more interaction with humans than elsewhere. It could well be that it's been recently released uh, by somebody and it's used to human contact. Uh, but there's definitely something out there. I'd love to know more about it. And I'm sure that many people in my constituency and many of your listeners would too. You mix with, of course, other organisations in your work as a politician, but including land-based, farming-based, people like Farmers Union for Wales, people like Country Land and Business Association, 
Do you ever touch base with them about it and do you get a view that they might be interested in participating in study and because uh, their membership, of course, would might have some information? Yes, of course. And um, some of their members do contact me when they, uh, when they see something on their own land. Sometimes they're a bit coy about reporting things to the authorities about what they've seen. But there is a genuine interest uh, in the whole subject. And, you know, I was just speaking to somebody from the CLA who visited the stand here, the Country Landowners Association. And it's very clear that there's a willingness to engage on these issues and hopefully a willingness for some of those landowners, some of those farmers to allow for research to be undertaken on their own land, Uh, especially uh, those that have seen things and experience things that they want to be able to understand better. Yeah, I think I think they're part of it very much in the sort of citizen science um, study we have to do. And we also want to say a big shout out and thank you to the Denby and Flint show because they've hosted us free today, recognising your interest and the importance of doing this. So anything you want to say about the show? Oh, well, look, this is a premier show, a premier agricultural show in Wales. It is the preeminent one in North East Wales. The organisers here are absolutely fantastic and very, very welcoming to anybody who comes along. And I think it's a great testament to their support of local elected representatives, uh, as well of all political colours, that they've expressed a willingness to host you today, Rick. And, you know, I think the fact that you've helped to draw people through the door as well in terms of ticket sales because you have had people who've come specifically to speak to you and specifically to learn more about big cats is one reason why I think they'll have you again again and again Brilliant. and they'll be yep. willing to welcome you again in the future that's lovely and of course there's just um, in the last couple of weeks a new Facebook group for sightings for the whole of Wales which I think is taking off and that will help advance the subject and people can swap notes on that which is very good news yeah yeah Before we sign off, Darren, anything else you'd like to say about the subject or the future? I just think, you know, my message to uh, any members of the general public who are listening into this particular podcast would be, you know, come forward, speak about your experiences, speak about the sightings, report them. If you've got evidence, bring it forward, share it with the Facebook group, send it into Big Cat Conversations, because that will help then to give more strength to our elbow about getting some proper research into this whole area properly funded research scientific research and if we can do that then we'll be able to understand these beautiful creatures which appear to be living amongst us Darren I want to thank you as a you know a senior politician and an experienced politician for taking a serious interest in the subject I think a lot of people give you a lot of support for that and um, long may it continue let's hope we can collaborate into the future and thank you ever so much for coming on the podcast it's my pleasure Rick and I hope to be a guest of yours in the future take care For our next guest, we have Carla, who is based in the Wirral in Cheshire. Carla has a family caravan in mid Wales, just north of Mahuntleth, where the family have been going to for generations now. Carla and her two daughters had an encounter on the 9th and the 10th of August, just before the Denby show. And we're recording this one a couple of weeks after the event. So, very nice that Carla can come on. Very topical incident. Carla, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Hi, Rick. Thanks for having me. Carla, this is an area that you know very well because although you're not from there, you visit it at least once a year and your family have done for generations. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, I've been going there since I was really little. My auntie had a caravan there. Before then, her mum and dad had one. Now my mum and dad have one and his brother and his other brother, there's loads of family members have caravans there, yeah. And you've heard about big cat sightings before this happened? It wasn't a bolt from the blue? Yeah, there's been quite a lot of stories, rumours around that area that I've heard. And then since I've said about what I've seen, people have said, oh yeah, well actually our Neil seen one or Darren seen one all different people coming out saying their experiences. Fellow caravan owners and caravan visitors at that area. Yeah, yeah. My brother used to have a den up at the side of the mountain and some of the family were up that way, just walking up the side of the mountain near to where that den was. One of the younger lads said, look, there's a cat. And they looked and it was a big cat. It wasn't a black one, it was more of a brown colour apparently. And then they just ran down the hill because they were 
obviously worried about it. He said it didn't do anything. It was just sitting there looking at them. Didn't chase them, didn't do anything. It was a good few years ago, but I didn't ask specific times. I'd imagine probably about 10 years. Yeah, okay, about 10 years ago. My mum was camping in a site not too far, in a tent. They'd been making a barbecue. They burned some of the burgers and they threw them down towards by the stream. And then a bit later on through the night, they heard a thumping sound. And then seeing something black whizzing past them. And they think it was a craft that had been to get the burgers and gone. What other wildlife do you see there? Do you get deer in that area, do you know? I haven't ever seen any deer. I've seen loads of rabbits around there. So you'd imagine if they did eat anything, it'd probably be rabbits. And there's a stream running through the caravan site, which is fresh water. So it would have plenty of drinking water. OK. Well, could we go on to your own encounter then? Take us through what happened on uh, the first day. On the first day, it was about just before 11. I took my daughters for a little walk with my dog and we were just walking through the site. And then just up ahead at the top of the hill, we see him what looked like my dog. I have a black Labrador and it looked like a black Labrador on first glance. And I noticed it straight away because I'm used to seeing my black Labrador walking around, you know. It caught my eye. And I said, oh, look at that, the top of the hill. And then I I looked again and I thought, that's a cat, it's not a dog. It was like prowling rather than trotting how a dog does. It was more of a cat walk. It was a little bit smaller than my dog, I'd say. And the kids seen it. And I was like, did you just see that? And they were like, yeah, we've just seen it. It was a big cat. I didn't notice the tail and a lot of people have asked me about what, sort of tail it was and I didn't notice it but my daughter said she noticed it was a really long tail and that she thought that's unusual for a dog that type of tail she's nearly 15. Did you notice that it didn't have a collar say it had been a dog it would have had a collar on most likely so did you notice that it was collarless? Well I didn't think about oh it hasn't got a collar on but I, I don't remember seeing a collar on it I didn't it was just a black a black sheep the kids are whispering to me the dogs aren't allowed off the leads good for them our listeners should know that um, two daughters are listening in and they are very welcome to add points it was a group encounter yeah so yeah dogs aren't allowed off the lead on that site you know the owner's really strict about it so there wouldn't have been a dog off the lead on that site. They just wouldn't have been. It's not like a normal site where you'd go where there's like a club on there or anything like that. It's more retired people who would stick to the rules and respect the area. And there's no dogs allowed off the lead. That's the rules and everyone follows it. Okay. And it was within the actual premises of the caravan park, was it? Yeah, yeah. It was on the premises, yeah. What did you guys think it was doing? It was zigzagging across the path. It was going from one side to the other and then back to the other and then it went to the right of us and went in the bush. Even that's unusual because on that side, the right side, is the fence for the caravan park. So there would have been no one there if it's just a bush. It would have went the other way if it was with someone. We would have seen it come out. And the colour, can you describe the colour? Jet black, same colour as my black Labrador. No markings, no texture that you could see? No, I couldn't see. I wasn't that close where I would have been able to see if it had little markings on it, but I'd just seen a jet black, what looked like a big cat, zigzagging across the path in front of us. Yeah, it was still close enough, but you wouldn't have seen the markings. Was it aware of you? Was it taking any action because you were coming along, or do you not know? I don't think it's seen us at first. It was just zigzagging, and then I think it did, and went into the bush, and I got the feeling it was more scared of us. What would you say the most sort of distinct 
feature of it was that you noticed about you know movement or shape or shoulder blades or thickness of legs anything like that yeah for me it was it was the color of it, it was black and it was moving like our cat does you know rather than a when, when a dog walks they sort of trap don't they but with the cat it was more like a prowl sort of prowling around I know you say that you don't think there are deer in that area, but say it had to predate deer, which most of them do if there are deer around. It was big enough to take down an adult deer, was it? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was the same size, as very similar size to my adult black Labrador. It was a working gun dog, you know, a sporty one. I've got the same myself. They're a good yardstick, aren't they? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but do you think it was a bit longer in the body than a lab, perhaps? Yeah, probably, yeah. It was probably a little longer and maybe a little bit chunkier. How did you all feel? Did you speak to each other about it? You know, what what happened next? I just said to them, oh, I wish I had my camera out because about two minutes before I had it out taking a picture of stuff around the site and then I just put it away and I was like, oh, why didn't I have my camera out then? And then I went to walk up and I thought, oh, no, I've got the dog, I'm going to go back it's not safe for Alfie so I thought I would just go back down and I didn't even think oh might attack me and the kids I was just thinking <laughs> it's gonna you know maybe go for me dog yeah so you had the dog on the lead with you on its lead yeah because you're not allowed your dog off the lead <laughs> did your dog notice the cat no I don't think he did he was just sniffing around and in terms of your Emotions, you know, fear, wonder, amazement. How did you all feel, do you think? I was just made up and went back and told my husband and he was like, oh, whatever, you know, he didn't really believe me. So stop going on about this stupid cat. (laughs) Because he's not really into that type of thing. So I was phoning everyone saying, I've just seen a cat. (laughs) And then I put it on Facebook. I'm not the type to do that either. So, you know, I don't really put things on Facebook, so I must have been excited about it, yeah. It then got onto the new Wales Big Cat Facebook group, didn't it? I think Big Cats of Wales is it what it's called. Yeah, someone commented on my post and said there's a, actually a group on this on Facebook, and I thought, oh, OK, I'll share it. Might as well I see if anyone's interested. And then I've had a lot of interest of it. So, yeah, people do believe how did you find the reaction? Did you find that helpful and positive, all of that reaction from the new Facebook group? Yeah, it was interesting anyway to see other people's encounters as well. It makes it more likely that what I seen was real. So, yeah, it was good. What do the girls think of it? They just think they've seen a big cat in the side of a mountain and that's it. They don't really think much more of it. Do they not think it's a bit cool or are they worried or, you know, do they think, gosh, there's a, a large carnivore? What do you think of it, girls? People have said they've seen it before, so, you know, it doesn't seem that rare. They think it doesn't seem that rare. They've heard so much of other people's stories. They're like, well, yeah. OK, it's a bit so what, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Do they think it's quite a cool thing to have seen, though, or, or are they worried, you know, if it could get the dog? They weren't worried about it, but I, me, the next day, I thought, I'm going to go back and see if I can get a photograph and uh, take a video of my steps to show, you know, my family who who have caravans there the way to get there. So I was just taking the video, and I thought, when I got to the top, I felt a bit eerie. I don't know why, I just had a weird feeling. And I turned my camera off and started to walk up the hill to where I'd seen it. And I got a few steps up and I just heard a hissing sound from that bush. I was saying where the cat went in. It was in that bush. It went like, you know, like that. It was a bit louder and a bit more aggressive, you know, like that type of sound. And it just froze. And then I turned around really slow took a few steps, and then I legged it down the hill faster than my dog. But you had the dog with you? Yeah, I I took the dog with me. I don't even know why. (laughs) I just thought I'd take the... I was going on a walk, and I thought, yeah, I'll take the dog with me, try and get a photo. When I look back, it's very silly of me, because 
could have been attacked. But I just didn't, I never thought it was going to be there, to be honest. Again, I just thought I'm going to go back. So how did the dog react? Did the dog pick it up and the dog react to the hiss? I don't know. He was definitely sniffing around that bush. I didn't look at the dog because I was in shock. I was that scared. I just froze. And I was just in a weird shock thing. And I turned around really slow. And then like that, I was scared for my life. I thought it was going to chase us. I actually thought it's chasing me until I got down to the bottom. And I thought, I'm I'm safe now. Because I was back by where all the caravans were. So it didn't really take much notice of what the dog was thinking about at all. He was just running alongside me. I was probably faster, which is unusual. You're utterly convinced that that was a cat noise and not any other animal, wild animal? No, it was definitely a cat hiss. Yeah, I mean, I've got a cat as well, and he sometimes hisses at the dog. It was like that, but louder. No other noise or movement? Nothing. It was just that noise. It must have, what I think is, I've been walking up and it's seen me and been protecting its territory, you know, like a territorial thing. You're disturbing it from its rest and it wants you to beat it. Yeah. Has that warning and that noise and that fact that you had to beat a hasty retreat, has that made you a bit more wary and scared for the future? Or do you just feel that was just unlucky, you shouldn't get too close and unlikely to happen again? I was at that place for a bit longer for the rest of the week and I didn't go back up there. <laughs> so I was like, no, I'm not going back up there, no way. <laughs> and how will these incidents influence you in the future, do you think, in that area or anywhere else? Will you have big cats on your mind now or can you just put it in perspective? What the weird thing is about it is when I was younger, I used to build dens in the area, in that exact same area. And I was saying to my two girls as we were walking up there, that's where I used to build my dens. And I could have left them the next day or later on that day if we didn't see it. Could have let them go up there and build a den. You know, they could have been up there, which is quite scary. I think about that and think, God, it's lucky we did see it because it could have been different. Yeah, yeah. Although, again, it might have given you a warning before you got too close. Yeah, but you don't know if they were just... I just thought if, maybe if they were building a den there and then it was hungry or something, it could have attacked them. You don't know, do you? How do you feel about the animals? Say the police or some authority got to know about this and said, we can't have one, a wild panther like that, around a caravan site where there are people and children playing, we will have to take it out somehow. We'll have to trap it and take it away or we'll have oh, no. to dispatch it. What would you feel about that? And how, what would the girls feel about it? Well, to be honest with you, it's not really a child-friendly site. It's not like a site where you'd have children. It's more of a retirement type of place and it is in the middle you know it's in a valley and it's it's wild and remote yeah it's not like it, it is their territory the caravan site is there but it's not you know it's not like a built-up place it's the caravans are there because it's that beautiful and close to nature you know we're disturbing them not the other way around the cats settled somewhere remote and wild and away from people. Yeah. So you think it would be unfair to take it out? Oh, yeah, 100%. I don't think they should do that, no. Definitely not. How do the girls think about that? Do they agree with you or any other views? Girls, would you think that the cat should be caught and took away? Or left alone? No, or left alone. Should be left alone. Maybe have warnings. Yeah, maybe have a warning sign. There may be big cats around here. Be careful. You're in big cat territory. Fair enough, yeah. Do you think that would, though, the, the very fact of having a sign up like that would scare people or even encourage the wrong kind of people? Yeah, I do worry about if people try and hunt them. My main worry was about actually coming on this show was maybe if people try and find it 
that's why I don't want to give too much away about the location. That's common with most of our podcasts, actually, especially if they're recent. Once they get many, many years on, it's less of an issue. In fact, um, at the at the Denby show, we had a sort of a board where people put sticky dots on their view. We had a list of types of things you might want to do if we knew there were big cats around. One of the options was leave them alone. And that was by far the most popular vote that we had scores of people putting their sticky dots on the statement that they yeah. agreed with most and leave them alone was the the most common one. In fact, another one was put up information signs and that got quite a few as well. Yeah, it's it's tricky though, isn't it, information signs, because it's a bit of a culture shock to have that. Yeah. So Carla, it was very interesting that um, Jonathan, who's been on a podcast recently, offered to follow up and check the area because I think he's got a base in North Wales so he travels up that way sometimes so I know that he made a journey just a few days before we recorded this and he did a little email note to you and you forwarded it to me he very kindly offered to look around and he did so and it may be because it's just very dry the landscape at the moment or certainly was at that time in the in the drought conditions and he didn't find any signs and didn't find any scat like droppings or whatever so he wasn't able to verify it with any trace evidence as it were and he also said and he, he's not accusing you of seeing a dog is it but he said somebody had a dog that really did look like a panther and had you seen that and I know that that was disappointing he didn't find any good stuff to follow up and verify and help your case but how did you find that? I was really excited for him to go and I was thinking oh what's he going to find and I was looking forward to hearing what he'd seen because I was like 100% sure he was going to find something. I thought, you know, he's got to. When he came back with that, I felt a bit like deflated and felt a bit silly. But I thought about it since then and the stuff he's come back with, which I'm really glad he went and he's doing a good job. The things that he said is he's seen someone with a dog that looked like... A, a bit like a black panther. A bit like it, yeah. And it was walking a bit like a cat, which I haven't seen that dog on the site myself. And I'm not saying he didn't see the dog, and he's not saying I didn't see a cat. But um, I'm just thinking the way it wasn't on a lead, the thing that I seen. And when he seen that dog, that was on a lead. And I wish I would have known when he was speaking to her, because then he could have said, do you ever let it off its lead? Because I know she wouldn't have. It won't have been the same. It wouldn't. It wasn't a dog. What I see, and it was definitely a cat. I'm not doubting that he did see that dog, and might have been. But yeah, I just don't think it was a dog. What I see, and I don't think she would have let him her dog off the lead on the site anyway. And there were three of you, and and you heard the hiss, the warning hiss, the next day, of course, which wasn't a dog-like sound. Yeah, and also I think. If it was a dog, my dog loves other dogs. He probably would have ran, tried to run up to it. Fair enough, then. Yeah. So it was it was frustrating and a bit, and as you say, deflating. He's a good chap to follow up. Yeah, and then another thing, he did say the area was quite sterile, but I've been researching it and it does say that in the wild the cats do bury the you know, after they've done the business. Sure, often they do, yeah, unless they want to leave it as a territorial marker, a signpost to another, yeah. I know he probably knows what he's looking for, but maybe that, maybe that's why, maybe it buried whatever it was doing. And they're clever animals, aren't they? They're not going to leave much around. So, And with it being dry, it was actually a heat wave. It was 31 degrees for a couple of the days while we were up there high in the 20s for the rest so yeah there was no rain or anything yes it would have been a bonus if he found anything he didn't it is frustrating but that's how it goes i'm glad he went (laughs) good stuff yeah so reflecting on it um carla now you've heard more people talk about local sightings in the past and you've heard of others in wales on the wales facebook group what do you make of the fact that there seem to be a number of big cats wild in Britain, possibly breeding and naturalising. You know, what's your attitude towards that? I have no doubt that there is, yeah. Like I was saying earlier, I've heard rumours 
for years anyway from locals around that area saying they've had sheep with the necks ripped out. People have had big paw prints on the cars. There's so many different sightings I've heard of and then I've seen it myself with my own eyes. That's what I think I've seen. There's no doubt in my mind that they do live in the UK. In terms of what, how do you feel about that emotionally and how do you feel about the cats themselves? Have you got any views on that? No, I think it's amazing. I think it's really good, yeah. It's good, isn't it? It's nice to know that there is big cats around. If you thought your dog was being threatened or even somebody's dog was taken by one, would that change your view? What's your view on that kind of thing? Um, oh, we've got the dog right on cue. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think he's happy about it. <laughs> I don't think it would be a problem. I think they're probably only going to attack if you're in their space. If you're out in the wild, like the deep wild, maybe keep your dog on a lead close to you and then carry a horn. I've been reading up, you know, if you have something that's loud, like like a horn, you just blow that and that scares them off apparently. So if there was, you could have guidance on what to carry with you if you're in the wild, where there might be cats like that, of steps you can see. So you're positive about it. Do you think the girl, your girls feel the same, do you think? Yeah, they're positive about it, yeah. We don't feel threatened in any way by what we see, you know. And obviously, when we went back and I heard the hiss, I was scared at the time. But it just shows you that it did actually give a warning. It didn't just attack, so just don't go and, you know, if that does happen, you just go away. Don't pick a fight with it. Yeah, same with, with anything really, isn't it? Do you think it will affect how you view the outdoors and how alert you are for sort of looking at nature in the future? Yeah, I used to walk around that mountain quite a lot when I was a child. I don't think I'll be letting my kids walk around there on their own. I used to do that like every time we went, every day. We'd just walk around it, me and my brother, when we were about, you know, 12. Just go for a walk around the mountain. I don't think I'd be letting my girls do that now, what I used to do. Because you don't know what's up there. At least two together, not on your own. Because it would be a shame if it prevented you enjoying nature, enjoying the outdoors. I would take, like, you know, like a horn that you got on a bike. Apparently, if you get one of them and you squeeze it, they don't like the loud noise and they'll run away, apparently. So, I don't know. I, w- I don't think I'd be scared because I think it would be more likely scared of us unless you're, like, you know, trying to go up to it. I don't think it's going to come up to you. There's plenty of rabbits. Yeah, plenty of rabbits around there. It's not going to be hungry and want to eat Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, well, thank you ever so much for giving us this um, very recent topical example from Wales. Is there anything else you want to say before we close off? Anything the girls want to to add if they've been listening in? No, they're a bit shy. (laughs) Do thank them for hanging around. She said uh, thanks for hanging around. She said thank you. Good stuff. Well, we ought to actually, uh, Carla, we ought to say that you're from the Wirral. Now, presumably you've heard reports in the Wirral. I mean, does it surprise you that there are credible reports ongoing in the Wirral area? Yeah, it does surprise me that. I thought if you're ever going to find them, it's going to be where the caravan is, up that way. Never thought you'd see them around here. I mean, I live in the suburbia area where there's like a golf course right next to me and there's loads of countryside not far from me and I do take the dog on walks around there. Never thought, oh, I might see a big cat here. Never heard any stories either until now. You've looked it up and you've seen, I mean, local newspapers had plenty in the last few years. Yeah. And we, In fact, we did a Wirral podcast episode, which you can listen to. Where about in the Wirral was it? Some inland woodland, because Wir- Wirral's a peninsula, isn't it, basically? Yeah. But quite a narrow one. And yes, I think in sort of woodland areas and near golf courses, but also round the edges with the marshland. 
Wirral has got a lot of wetlands and marshlands on, on the edges, which, of course, yeah. the cats would love. So I guess they come in from those via woodlands and golf courses and occasionally get seen in areas which are a bit more residential or the edge of residential areas than you'd expect. But they're probably not there regularly and routinely because it's such a varied place, isn't it, the Wirral, actually? There's about three big golf courses and several stretches of woodland. So there's, you know, some real green corridors cats could use. Yeah, I'll have to look more into that. It's interesting. So you may not have to go to Mid Wales to experience one again. <laughs> I'll be on the lookout now. <laughs> would you like to see one again, you folks? Yeah, I would feel OK about seeing one. I don't think I would go looking for one in that particular part of Wales again. I don't think I'd be like up that same hill on my own again. <laughs> but I will definitely be keeping an eye out for them now, now that I've seen one. Thank you, Carla. Really good to have you and the the girls on the podcast. Thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for contributing a, a very topical recent example to our Wales edition. So many thanks. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. With our next guest, Michelle is based near Carmarthen in mid-southwest Wales and she's going to brief us on an encounter she had back in the summer of 2007. So Michelle, thanks for coming on the show. You're welcome. Yeah, I've always been fascinated by big cat sightings. Thanks Michelle, good to have you with us. And that was going to be my first point to quickly check with you. Before the incident, did you have a take on big cat sightings? Were you aware of them and what did you think of them? I was aware, I, I must admit, a good 20-odd years earlier, possibly 30-odd years earlier, I'd had a bit of an experience, not in Wales, in Cornwall. I was driving my parents back. I'd just learned to drive. We were driving from Cornwall back up to the Midlands, going through Launceston, I think it was. It was early morning, and there was this big black creature just lying in the road. It wasn't a cow. It was, it was too small for a cow, and it certainly wasn't a dog because it was too, it wasn't a dog. I could tell it wasn't a dog. I was quite scared. It was early morning. So I, I just drove around it. I didn't stop to think, oh, I'll have a look what it is. It didn't move. So it was obviously either injured or dead. I didn't hear any reportings about anything, anyone finding anything. So maybe it was just asleep and just got up. I don't know. So that was my first introduction to big cats being out there. Gosh, yeah. And we've got a bonus on that one. Do you think it was warming itself on the road? I mean, that's another possibility. But then if it was awake and fit and healthy, it presumably would have moved because you would have disturbed it, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think it would have moved moved out of the way. But this was not going to move out of the way. So I drove round it. And, and I had my parents in the car and they saw it as well. And it was kind of like dawn light. So it wasn't, it wasn't light light, but it was... You could just about see. So, yeah, it was very odd, very odd. We all sort of said, what the hell was that kind of thing? But didn't think, well, I think we were all scared really to stop. So, unfortunately, we didn't. That was Launceston area, you say? Launceston, yeah, in Launceston. There's been an alleged sighting from there in the press, I think, uh, about a week before this, we're recording this one. There you go, it uh, remains a potential live area. Yeah. Before that, was that your introduction to the subject or had you seen newspaper reports or heard gossip about the subject and did you have a view on it? You always used to get them popping up in the newspapers or on the news, you know, for those fuzzy photographs that you see that people have taken. It never surprised me. I always thought that there was a possibility of big cats roaming the country. I was fascinated in it. I hadn't seen anything before then previously. I was open-minded about it. Okay, so go to 2007 then, the summer, and you're near Carmarthen and you're driving locally and something happened. So can you take us through the incident? Yeah, I was uh, on my way to work. It was a early summer's morning. It was about half six, quarter to seven. So there wasn't um, hardly any other traffic on the road. It was in the summer, so I think it would have been about July. So it was fairly light at that time at the mo- in the morning. It was quite a a rural uh, little village, rural village, just the other side of Carmarthen. And it was quite a a, a windy, bendy road. But as I came out of this bend, the road went straight. 
And I, as I came into the straight stretch of road, I happened to glance to my left, which was farmland and fields, and I could see this black, I'll call it a creature, but a black cat, walking at the top end of the field, just walking from one side to the other. It was just that split second thing. And then I thought, that's not an ordinary domestic cat because I could see from the size, from the distance I was away from it. But I could see, even then, I could judge that it was bigger than a, a domestic cat. I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't, couldn't hear if any of the birds were disturbed. I think there was sheep in the other fields, although, again, because I was driving, I was having to concentrate on that, really. So I didn't notice if they were upset or anything by the animal's presence. Yeah, and can you give us as good a description of the form and key features as, as you can? In colour-wise, it, it was a black cat. It was, it was like the, the black cats uh, that have been reported. And it was the shape of a feline. It it had the tail of a cat. It had the the head shape, um, you know, and the body shape of a cat. If it wasn't for the size, for the distance it was, I would have thought it was a a, a domestic black cat. It was that shape. Was the grass um, a reasonable height? Because a a domestic cat wouldn't have appeared beyond the uh, sort of high grass or medium length grass, presumably, unless it was cut or being grazed. It hadn't been cut short. It it was just, it wasn't a field that was used for growing veg or anything in it. So the grass was, you know, at a, I'd say sort of knee high height, really. But I could see this this cat walking in it. Is there anything about the tail at that that, that distance that you could work out, like its length and thickness? It looked quite a thick tail, and it was the general, the the shape, you know, of it coming from the bottom and going down and then coming round again in like a little curl, if you you know what I mean. Just It wasn't bushy at the end or anything. It was fairly smooth in shape. Anything about the movement? What kind of locomotion did it have? It was just walking quite slowly, to be honest. It didn't seem concerned or worried or it it wasn't stalking. It it just seemed to be just walking from one end of the field to the other in just a general slow kind of walk. It was quite graceful in its walk. And, And again, I think that made me think that's a big cat, the way it was walking. Compared to a Labrador dog, how would you compare the scale and the length of this animal? Probably a little bit longer than Labrador and a little bit taller. Than, than your average Labrador. And I know you get Labradors in all shapes and sizes. It was, it was a more um, sleeker animal than a Labrador or a dog would have been. You know, I could tell by the shape it was quite a sleek animal. And would you have assumed that it was properly wild? Did it seem properly wild, fit and healthy? I think so. It, it, it certainly, from its, its walking, I couldn't sort of tell it, it. It certainly wasn't limping or anything or, it, you know, it wasn't slow in walking. It was just a nice, you know, like you'd watch your domestic cat walk across the lawn. It was just that kind of a one going from this side of the field to the other. You know, it, the, there was nothing um, that, that I could sort of pick out that it was ill or, you know, underfed or anything like that. It didn't look like that from where I was. And although it was an open field that he was walking from, the area is surrounded by woodland. Would you have had time, if you'd thought about it, would you have had time to get your phone out and take a photo if you had a mobile phone with a camera at the time, or was it simply too far away, or was the driving conditions not um, suitable for that? Yeah, possibly the driving. Um, I mean, I could have, uh, there wasn't really anywhere to pull over. I mean, it was it was quiet. There wasn't a lot of traffic on the road, so I, I could have stopped, but it wouldn't have been in an ideal place. It was coming up to a junction, and if I'd have gone left at the junction, I possibly could have gained another way of seeing the cat because it was in the field on there on the left of it. But yeah, certainly if I'd, if I'd have had a, a phone and I'd have stopped quickly, I could have I could have taken a quick a quick snap. And say it wasn't in any rush walking across the fields at all. Do you think it would have been, though, a blob in the distance? Do you think you would have got much of the uh, of the form to show people? And and if you'd have zoomed in, it would have pixelated. Would it have been one of those kinds of photos? Two thousand and six. Obviously, phone technologies and cameras have moved on since then. But certainly, then it wouldn't have been much of a much of a shot. No, which is a shame. So what did you do afterwards? And did you tell people and did you learn of anything else in that area that you'd heard about or did you keep it to yourself because you felt you might be ridiculed or how did you react? 
Yeah, I don't think I told people straight away. I don't think I got to work and said, I've just seen a black cat. I think I, I certainly told my husband when I got home and said, I've seen a black cat and discussed it with family members and things. They didn't dismiss it, but I don't think they took too much, you know, they didn't read too much into it. But yeah, I don't, I don't think I sort of went to work and said, oh, I've just seen a black cat. But there have been, in, in certainly in that area, uh, I found out since, and in areas not far from there, there have been over the years of the sightings of black cats on farms and uh, in surrounding areas. When you say black cats, you mean panther size, you know, black leopard size. Sorry, cats, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Incidentally, did you go back and try and look up what you might have seen? Did you try and check the species and check classification of it? Or did you just think that's a black panther, most likely, because of the scale? I did look at photos. I did put in black cats and obviously it brought up quite a few things. And panther, black panther is is one of the things. And that's certainly what I thought it looked like to me was, was the black panther type cat. So other reports you've heard... Can you remember any of them in detail? This is a bit further out from Carmarthen, but it was in one of the communities I used to work in regularly, so it's probably in the last five years. There were certainly sightings of a cat of some kind in um, an elderly lady's back garden that was seen not, not only by her but by someone else. Sort of lots of farmland and fields around it, but, it, but there are houses as well. So she probably would have had a small garden and it was in her back garden I think that it, that it was seen and I think that's seen by a couple of people in her garden but I think someone else in the same area saw it as well at a different time and I think it did get into the press that it was seen in the garden um, by this lady I don't know if she'd let a dog out or a cat out and it was in the back garden there's reports in in other small villages in and around Carmarthen of animal carcasses being found on farms, sheep carcasses, and, and it's the way that they've been eaten that's sort of rang alarm bells. There's reports of footprints being found, cat foot, uh, paw prints that are too large for a domestic cat again, that have been found in farmland. So yeah, so quite a few reports in this area of West Wales. Yeah, and what do you make of that? And what do you think other local people make of these reports? Do you think it's just an ongoing thing? It, it never gets too problematic. They seem to be behaving themselves. Is there any kind of trend you pick up in attitudes or awareness in, amongst uh, people? I think the farmers get concerned. Obviously, you know, if they start losing vast amounts of, of livestock, and as you say, if it gets reported in, in, in the local press, then... People don't like to talk about it because, like you said earlier, they don't want people rushing to that area to overtake it kind of thing. When you read the, the reports of the local area of people who've seen things or found things, they do take it seriously. They think there are big cats out there and they do take that seriously as an issue. How do you personally feel about it? Have you got a view? One of our previous guests for this South Wales quota of reports said she found it exciting more than anything. She's a farmer's daughter, I, I might add. There can be different, you know, takes on it. I would like to see one. I would like to see one up close. It would be terrifying. I wouldn't know what my reaction would be. But I agree in, in some respects. It, it would be exciting to see one. Yeah. And there have been reports, haven't there, people just coming across one. So, you know, it could happen. And has it influenced you? I mean, when you drive or when you walk in the countryside, do you think, well, you know, there are big cats around and I'm hoping to see one? Or does it make you have some kind of heightened alertness? Or does it make you more observant? It does if I've heard of reports in those areas around that time. It's not in my mind all the time where I might come across one. And I walk regularly, I walk my dogs in fields regularly. So it's not an active thought that, oh my God, you know, I could meet a big cat here. But if there's been a report in the local area of someone sighted one or whatever, then, yeah, I, I would be heightened to that. I did have another experience. <laughs> yeah. In Carmarthen, on the other side of Carmarthen, in another village, and I didn't actually see anything, but there had been... I, I, I wasn't aware of this, but there had been a sighting of a big cat in this area in the, in the recent weeks. And we'd taken our young children at the time and two of our dogs, we've taken them into some woods that you can actually walk dogs in. 
And we were walking in this really sort of bramble covered enclosed bit of the wood. And there was fields on the other side and there was cows in the other field. I could see the cows, but I could also hear something breathing and it seemed to be walking alongside us on the other side of the thick hedge. I couldn't see anything, but I could certainly hear this thing breathing as it was walking along with us. And that was quite nerve wracking. It wasn't a cow that was following us. It was light footed, was it, as far as you could tell? Yeah, you, you couldn't really hear it walking. You could hear the rustle of a, a bramble or something occasionally, but it was it was more the breathing. I could hear the breathing as it was kind of, say, stalking, but it, it was walking alongside us from the other side of the hedge that we were. And you couldn't see through the hedge. It was quite thick, so you, you wouldn't have got a view of what was on the other side. It was paralleling you, really. Yeah. Did it affect the dogs? They were walking ahead. My husband and my young son had got the dogs. So it was me and my daughter who were walking behind and they didn't hear anything at the front. So it seemed to be walking alongside me and my daughter. We, we hadn't got the dogs with us. And as I say, it was only after that event that I then found, again, in a local news report, that there'd been a sighting in that area, you know, a few weeks previously. So that was quite, you know, scary. Of course, you never know. That's the frustrating thing, isn't it? But of course, you know, it's not the behaviour of a deer. It's not the behaviour or a horse. And another dog wouldn't have been that stealthy, I presume. It was just odd. I, I knew it wasn't a cow. Like you say, it didn't have a heavy tread or anything like that or a horse. But I could certainly hear this breath as it was walking alongside us. The final thing on your attitudes. Say there was some kind of policy, even if it was difficult to implement, and a realisation that, yeah, we've got potentially black leopards around Carmarthenshire and the Carmarthen area, and we can't have that. There was a view that it, that they'd have to be eradicated somehow. What would you make of that? What would your view be on that? Leave them be, is my view. Yes, they take the odd sheep and the odd bit of livestock, but they don't cause that many problems. To my mind, just let them exist alongside us. I don't think there's any reports of them attacking humans. And until that point, then I'm quite happy to, to live alongside them. What if one took your dog or you had one sort of eyeing up your dog and threatening your dog? Would that change your view at all, do you think? A little bit, I think, my dog. Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? <laughs> You've got to be mindful that it is, it is a wild animal and therefore it, if it wants to attack, it will attack. It's not a tame little pet. If it attacked the dog and took the dog, yeah, it'd be a difficult one to answer. It, it would probably change how I felt about it. But um, at the moment, as I say, I'm quite happy to... Coexist. Yeah, yeah. And that takes us on to, to my final question, really. I think you sort of half answered it. What's your general attitude towards these cats, like black leopards, are potentially naturalising across Britain. Have you got a view on that? Many years ago, there used to be wolves. There used to be wild boar. There used to be beavers. There used to be all these kind of creatures around. So, yeah, I'm, as I say, I'm quite happy them to, for them to be here. So we have to learn to coexist with them as much as we can? I think so. Thank you ever so much for giving us some, you know, a few more snippets from mid-southwest Wales. Finally, is there anything else you'd like to say, anything else you'd like to emphasise that we haven't covered? I find it interesting that it's not just in one area. It seems to be little pockets, but the same little pockets, if that makes sense. It, they're, they're not that far from each other, to be honest, where they've been spotted. It's not just something that's happened in recent years. The, some of the reports, if you read them, go back quite a long time, you know, 60s, 70s, and, and the, the reports are, are ongoing. Kaylee, our previous guest, closer to you on the South Wales ones, she said that she thinks a lot of people just have this general awareness of it and just keep it quiet. You know, they don't want to sort of rattle a cage about it, draw attention to it. Do you think there's quite a lot of that about it, that people just accept it as a background issue and don't make want to make too much of a fuss about it? Yeah, I think they do. And I think I'm not a farmer's daughter. I'm not. I'm from 
a city background, but I've worked with and I've known a lot of country people, farm folk, and I think they're just very independent. They like to keep themselves to themselves. They don't want to create a fuss. They see something, they are going to keep it to themselves. I think Kaylee's right about that. Uh, and also, I think sometimes people are embarrassed to talk about it. Or, you know, you still a big cat. No, they don't exist. And I think, you know, for that reason, people just don't want to say that what they've seen or if they have seen anything. I think it's something they talk about in the pub, but they wouldn't talk to outsiders about it. Yeah. Well, Michelle, thank you very much for covering those points for us and, um, you know, potentially taking us through three incidents. We thought we'd get one, but we got one and two halves. And if only you'd stopped and taken a photo of that first one or plucked some hair or... I regret it to this day, but there you go. Yeah. I mean, in the spur of the moment, there's always other things distracting, aren't there? In those days, no dash cam, of course. No uh, mobile phones then either. It was early 80s, I think. So, yeah, no, uh, no mobile camera phones or anything. So... Yeah. Do you think, would you would you say it was the same animal that you saw in the distance in 2007? Same type of animal? The same type. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. The, the archetype, black leopard, black panther. So you've seen one right up close and one in the distance. That's quite good going. Yeah. And I've heard one, hopefully. Yes, yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank you ever so much for your time, Michelle. Great to hear more from South Wales. I hope we'll be back to South Wales with more guests in the future. But meantime, thanks ever so much for coming on Big Cat Conversations. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Rick. Okay, we will be back to Wales within a few episodes, speaking with Mark and with Ewan, who have both recently seen and filmed what seem to be lynx-like cats in mid-South Wales. Some of you in Big Cat Facebook groups will be aware of their footage and their exploits, so it'll be good to talk through the incidents with them directly and hear about how they are following up those events. We began this episode at the Denby Show, and you can see a few photos from that show on the Big Cat Conversations website under episode 81 on the References and Links page. And prominent amongst the photos is the final result of the Attitude Survey on people's views on big cats living here. And you'll see there was an overwhelming vote in favour of Leave Them Alone as a key option to take. It was, of course, great to meet so many interested people at the show and learn some snippets of what's getting reported in North East Wales. And we must say a big thanks to the show for hosting us. One of the standout features of the large cat reports received there from North East and North Wales was the fact that there were no puma descriptions, only blacks and lynx-like cats. Now, for our word of the week, we have the Latin term for big cats, which is magnus catus and we're grateful to Claire in Scotland for pointing that out and mentioning it. In fact, she's used that term as the title for her entry to our poetry competition, and Claire agreed to me reading out her poem, so here goes with Magnus Catus. If you believe such stories, tales and hype, there's a feline larger than the domestic type, who's made Great Britain her native home, and here she belongs, free to roam. You could catch a glimpse of darkest black, of powerful muscle across her back, or perhaps a proud beige with tufts and stripes, taking the countryside in her great stride. Some have seen grey, orange and spots. Truth is, our feline's not one, but lots. Released or escaped, it matters little to me. It's interesting, yes, but more importantly, these cats have established and earned their place in the UK. I hope she remains elusive, so here she will stay. Wonderful stuff, Claire. So nice to have that one. And thanks to everyone else who's sent poems and limericks so far. Please keep them coming till deadline time, which is mid-October. The prizes include Big Cat Conversations t-shirts, as well as Dartmoor Beast Gin, Dartmoor Beast Hot Chilli Sauce, Stroud Brewery's Big Cat Ale, Exmoor Ales Brewery Exmoor Beast Beer, and Beast of Bodmin Ale from Firebrand Brewery. So thanks so much to those sponsors for joining in and helping us. We'll put photos of their products on our website soon. 
Coming up on the podcast, we are due a return to Scotland before long, hearing about some recent key reports, and we'll have feedback from some of the recent rural shows there where Paul and David have had big cat stands. But next time, we are visiting Derbyshire, hearing about a series of sightings over the summer there. And we've heard about the use of thermal cameras already on the podcast this year, and we return to that theme within the Derbyshire edition. OK, it's time to close out now, so a big thanks to our guests. Look forward to being back with you soon. Take care and bye for now. Bye.